Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on Christology. Thank you all for uh, uh, joining class. We'll just uh, pray and that uh, you know, the others will also join as well. Um, anyone can lead us in prayer this morning? Can anyone lead us in prayer, please? Father God, we thank you for this morning and we come before you, Lord. We thank you for new day, Lord, my Father. We thank you for this class, my Father. As we're going to start our class today, my Father, help us, guide us, my Father. Help us to understand more deeply, my Father, Lord. And I thank you for our men, Selena, my Father. Thank you, my Father. We give you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chira. Uh, so we'll begin looking at uh, what we were studying uh, the last two weeks. I hope you're uh, enjoying the Christology class and it's not kind of overwhelming you or kind of, uh, you know, confusing you. I hope you're enjoying the study. Yes. Is it too confusing? Is it too difficult for you all to understand? And I have some... Uh, Thoughts on that? Some inputs from the students? Are you all enjoying the Christology class? So we have just had uh, four hours, just two classes. Okay, I uh, hope it's not confusing or it's too much. Okay, thank you, Nina, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nina Santosh, this is learning a lot. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Any suggestions on how we can go about this class? Any suggestions you all have? No, Pastor, you're doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lynn. I hope you all are following the notes. Um, there are some extra little uh, information um, <clears throat> for our study purpose that I'm adding in. So you would like to make a, a note of that as well. It will help you. Okay. So just a quick uh, recap of what uh, we did the last two uh, weeks. We studied about uh, what Christology is. Uh, you know, it's a field within Christian theology. So we studied, we looked at what Christian theology is. We defined Christian theology. Uh, we defined what theology is. We defined what um, uh, Christology is. And we basically said in Christology, you know, we will be looking or studying of how humanity and deity exist in real unity uh, in one person that is in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. So we're basically looking at how uh, humanity and deity coexisted in perfect unity in the person of um, uh, Jesus Christ. So for that, we will be studying about his pre-existence, the eternal nature of Christ. Uh, we'll be looking at the Old Testament prophecies about Christ, Christ's humanity, his deity, his incarnation, uh, his sinlessness, his death, resurrection, ascension, exaltation, and his uh, return. <clears throat> I hope you've uh, taken some time to go through your notes so that you know you'll be able to uh, connect through even as we uh, follow through each uh, uh, week in the uh, in the classes, uh, so that there is a good connect, there is a good flow of thought, even of what your understanding is, and also when you read through, if you have any questions, uh, you know. You could ask them and uh, we'll try to answer those uh, questions in um, class. Okay, so we we'll began by looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Jesus is God, that he is deity. We looked at the deity of Christ. And of course, all of this, what we're studying about um, uh, in Christology is basically we're going to look at various scripture passages. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at the New Testament. Uh, and then we're, uh, you know, uh, 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 coming to a conclusion of what scripture talks about uh, uh, the deity and the humanity of um, uh, Jesus Christ and how both of them existed in perfect unity, coexisted in perfect unity in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. So in chapter one, we looked at uh, the pre-existence of uh, 
of Christ, uh, that he was there even before uh, the world began. He was there when uh, everything was being created. It was through him that all things were created. We're going to look at that today. We're looking at uh, his uh, role in creation. Uh, but, you know, we tried answering these questions. Did Christ exist before he came into the world? Uh, if he existed, who was he? Uh, so we uh, we answered those questions in uh, those two questions in chapter one, where we talked about the pre-existence of Christ. And basically, uh, uh, good scripture passages that talk about the pre-existence of Christ, uh, which are the scripture passages that talk about the pre-existence of Christ? John 1 verse 1 to 4. Okay, thank you, Erwin. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. What else? Anyone else? Philippines 2, uh, 5 to 7. Uh, Philippines chapter 2, 5 to 7. Thank you, Anina Santosh. Yes. Uh, so we saw, we studied those two passages in detail. We'll be studying uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7 in detail uh, in a few classes from now. Uh, we also saw that Jesus himself, you know, uh, 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 you know, um, when he, he is uh, speaking to the crowd, uh, he um, uh, asserts for himself or he, you know, um, uh, gives his name, uh, calls himself or describes uh, uh, himself as the I am. And we read that in uh, John chapter 8, verse um, uh, 58, uh, where Jesus said that, you know, sure, uh, surely I say to you before Abraham uh, was I am. So, you know, um, that is, uh, you know, Jesus making an assertion of who he is and basically, uh, you know, uh, identifying himself with the Godhead uh, with the same name that uh, uh, God revealed uh, uh, of who he is or identified himself in the Old Testament to Moses as I am who I am. And we see that Jesus was claiming uh, for himself the same title as I am and uh, uh, which proves that he or he's designating himself as uh, God as the eternal existing one who is self-sufficient, uh, who is, uh, uh, you know, all-knowing, uh, self-sufficient and self-existent. So, you know, by um, ascribing him to himself this title as I am, he's identifying himself with the Godhead, he's identifying himself with with the, how, how God identified himself in the Old Testament the name, with the title, I am. And, uh, you know, hence Jesus is saying that, you know, he is the eternal existing one. He is the self-existing one. Uh, he's a self-sufficient one. Uh, and he is, uh, you know, God. So we also looked at uh, his other scripture passages uh, from uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and Matthew chapter 2, verses 1, 2. Um, six last class we looked at uh, uh, you know again uh, went on to prove that Jesus Christ is God his uh, deity by looking at his equality uh, with the Father and uh, the Spirit the Holy Spirit uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, that Jesus Christ is God he's co-equal with God the Father God the Son uh, God the Holy Spirit, so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit uh, are co-equal, they have the same nature that makes them God, uh, the same attributes, the same essence uh, that makes them God, uh, and hence we see that Jesus is uh, God. So how do we prove that uh, Jesus is God? One way is showing that he is equal with the Father, and uh, we looked at, uh, again, John chapter 1, verses 1 uh, to 3, where he's, it says, you know, the word whom John uh, refers to as uh, the Logos, uh, as Jesus Christ, uh, who was in the beginning, which means uh, a dateless past, uh, eternity past, uh, who was with God and who was also God. And hence, we see that uh, Jesus is co-equal uh, with the Father. We looked again at the same reference in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, uh, where uh, you know, it says that Jesus is uh, in the very form of uh, God. That means, uh, you know, uh, uh, he is uh, he shared 
uh, with the glory of the deity. He's uh, having the same essence, the same nature uh, that makes God, God. And uh, so Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7 tells us that he's equal uh, with God. And also we looked at John chapter 8, verse 58. I'm uh, not going to explain that again. And then spe we looked uh, specifically at uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where, you know, Isaiah is prophesying about uh, the Messiah who's going to come, the son who's to be born, and uh, there are various titles ascribed to the son who is Jesus. And uh, of the titles that have been ascribed to Jesus uh, through the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, we see two specific names, Mighty God and Everlasting Father. Uh, Mighty God means uh, Omnipotent One and uh, the All-Powerful One. Uh, and we know that the Jews uh, or the Old Testament uh, refers to God as the Mighty All-Powerful One. Uh, and also He's the Everlasting Father, which means uh, dateless uh, past, uh, who was always there and who will always exist who always existed and will always exist, uh, Everlasting Father, which is uh, the names that they were familiar, the Jewish audience were familiar with the God they worshipped, the God of the Old Testament. And when these same titles were ascribed to uh, uh, Jesus, it uh, proves that he is co-equal with God, uh, the Father. It's also proving that this child who was to be born, the Messiah, is God, uh, incarnate um, and we also said that you know these these two titles that were ascribed to God or God the Father you know um, uh, is not in conflict with God the Father but uh, you know uh, it reveals the eternal nature and the character of uh, God as Father and uh, even though the same title has been ascribed to God the Father and God the Son uh, there is no conflict because they are one they exist in perfect uh, unity and oneness. Uh, we also saw uh, the names of Alpha and Omega, uh, which means the beginning and the end, which uh, or the first and the last. Uh, Alpha is the first uh, uh, alphabet in the Greek um, uh, uh, language, and Omega is the last uh, word in the Greek language alphabets. So uh, Jesus ascribing to himself as uh, the title of Alpha and Omega. We read that in Gen Revelation chapter 21, verses 6 and 7. And we also see, uh, you know, in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, verse 12, where uh, God is referred to as or calls himself as I am the first and the uh, last. So the same titles that were that God uh, uh, identifies himself or refers to himself in the Old Testament is the same title that Jesus is also ascribing to himself, uh, that which we read in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, and Revelation uh, 21, verse 6 and 7, and Revelation 22, verses um, 13. So um, uh, we also looked and studied um, John chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Of course, this uh, whole scripture passage is not given in your notes, uh, but we studied it. Um, uh, about the whole passage about how Jesus heals a lame man and uh, you know it it became a big controversy because uh, he had healed uh, this lame man invalid man for 38 years uh, on a Sabbath day and Jesus instead of you know kind of avoiding the controversy and getting out of the crowd uh, you know he claims to be equal with God the Father and uh, we read verses uh, 19 to 27 um, where Jesus claims that God is his father. And when he does that, you know, he's, uh, he, he's claiming that he possesses the same divine nature as God himself. Uh, we also looked at uh, the same chapter, John 5, verse 21, where uh, uh, Jesus says, For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to all, all those he uh, will. So, um, uh, you know, the Jews understood that, you know, uh, life is only from God. Uh, God only has the, sorry, God only has the power to give life. And now when Jesus is claiming that the son gives life to whom he wills, uh, you know, uh, he's, Jesus is claiming the same power as God the Father, and hence he's uh, proving that he is equal with God the Father. 
uh, and he goes on to talk about how you know the son the father judges no one uh, but god the father has committed the judgment to his son uh, uh, john chapter 5 verse 22 uh, because the jews understood that you know god alone was the one who had the authority to judge the world now when jesus claims he's you know he has this privilege that god the father has given him this privilege uh, and he also mentions why God the Father has given him the privilege because all those who honor the Son uh, 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 should, uh, 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 sorry, all those who honor the Father uh, should also honor the Son in the same way because the Father has sent the uh, Son, verse 23 uh, of John chapter 5. So we see that the Jews knew that, they, you know, uh, they could only honor and worship uh, God. And here Jesus was uh, saying that, you know, uh, I've been given, uh, you know, uh, committed the authority to judge, uh, and hence I have the honor. Uh, so hence you need to give me the honor just like you honor my uh, father. So Jesus claims the same right to be worshipped and honored as uh, the father. Um, so we see that, you know, um, uh, he is equal with God the father. We also saw how he is equal with God the uh, holy spirit okay um but we also looked at uh, john chapter 14 verse 28 where jesus says you know um you will do the father says uh you know uh, uh jesus says i'm going back to the father uh for my father is greater than i uh it does not mean that you know god the father is greater and god the son is lesser uh being uh uh and God the Holy Spirit is lesser than the Son and lesser than the Father. No, uh, it's just talking, uh, you know, all of them are uh, um, co-equal uh, in their nature, in the essence. They are co-eternal persons of the Trinity. They have the divine nature that makes them God. But in roles, uh, they have different roles. And hence, that sense of, you know, uh, hierarchy is there. Uh, but uh, all of all three of them, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, are co-equal uh, and co-eternal persons. They have the same one divine nature that makes them God, but in roles they are different. And that's why Jesus says, uh, for my Father is uh, greater than I. So we looked at uh, uh, this in the last class. And of course, John chapter 5 um, all that I explained from John chapter 5 is not there in your notes, but I just hope that, uh, you know, made a note of it so that, you know, when um, you have to defend your faith, defend uh, that Jesus is God, you can use uh, these scripture passages. You can use this to explain to people and also use this to, uh, you know, edify people and build them up uh, in their faith that Jesus is God and that he is co-equal with God the Father, God and not the police but okay so that's uh very briefly uh <laughs> kind of briefly uh a recap of what we studied in um uh, lesson one and lesson two anyone has any questions i hope you're reading the notes and i'm sure you must be having any questions when you are reading anyone has any questions anything that you like to clarify Okay. Okay, if there are no questions and uh, no clarifications required, then uh, we'll move on to uh, chapter three. Um, uh, thank you, Viku and uh, Jackin. Uh, we'll move on to uh, chapter three, where we'll be looking at, uh, again, um, you know, looking at the deity of God and proving that he is God, um, you know, um, by looking at his role in uh, creation okay so uh, we try to prove the deity of god by talking about his pre-existence uh, we try to prove the deity of god by looking at his equality with the father and the holy spirit and uh, uh, we can also prove that jesus is god by looking at his uh, role in um, creation so in this chapter we will just briefly be looking at christ's role in um, creation so you all can follow through with your um, uh, with your notes. 
uh, and I'm just going to give you some extra information um, uh, when, we, when we're studying Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 18, which will just help us, uh, you know, understand better and try to, uh, you know, uh, you know, be when we do apologetics or defend our Christian faith or try to prove a deity, we can use uh, also Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18 um, uh, to prove that Jesus is um, God. Okay, so we look at uh, Christ's role in creation and hence prove that uh, he is deity, that he is uh, God. Okay, uh, we we'll look uh, again back at the same scripture passage that we were, uh, you know, uh, dwelling on the, in the first and second lesson, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. So can one of you please read that again? Good to know John chapter 1. Uh, by memory, also good to know at least verses 1 to 3 or 1 to 5 in memory. Yes, Viman. Can somebody was read John chapter word. 1 verses 1 to 3? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Amen. Thank you, Vimal. So um, we know this word is uh, referring to uh, Jesus. Uh, so we see that Jesus is God. He was with God. Uh, he is God. He was there in the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, verse 3, uh, which we'll be looking at today, all things were made through him. So everything that we see in existence, all of creation that we see, was made through him and without him nothing was made that was made so everything that exists was uh, is because it was made through Christ Jesus Christ and nothing that we uh, that was made was uh, made without uh, him so basically john is revealing to us that this word you know uh, who is jesus christ is um, uh, God, he was with God, he was in uh, uh, in the beginning, and uh, he was the one who, uh, you know, was instrumental in bringing about all of creation, in creating um, everything, okay? Uh, we look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and we're going to be uh, dwelling on this uh, more today in our today's class we'll be studying more about this uh, so Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 uh, but I would like us to read um, uh, you know Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to the end of the chapter so can somebody uh, read Colossians chapter 1 verses uh, 15 to the end of the chapter please He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and out of reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to his worship from God, which is given to me for you to fill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Thank you, Rin. Um, so very uh, important uh, passage of scripture, actually Colossians chapter 1 uh, verses 15 to 18 has been called the great Christology. Uh, uh, various uh, uh, commentary writers, uh, theologians, uh, uh, you know, um, have given this title to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, and they call it as the great Christology. Now, some of these things that I'm uh, mentioning is not in your notes, so if you'd like to make, a, uh, you know, take down points, you could. Um, because this is a very important passage of scripture and will be important and will be nice if you could, you know, uh, listen carefully, think through, you know, make your own notes uh, so that it can help you and also help you to, uh, you know, be a blessing and help others to understand. So Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 18 has uh, been called as a great Christology because, uh, you know, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, um, uh, you know, uh, is who is inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, has this inspired conviction and understanding of just who Christ is. So it is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he's writing all of this. And, uh, you know, he has this deep inspired conviction, uh, this deep knowing, this deep assurance and this deep understanding of who this Jesus uh, Christ is. This Jesus Christ is not just a prophet, not just a teacher, uh, is not just uh, the Messiah they were looking for, uh, is not just a miracle worker, uh, a, a good man, but this Jesus Christ is um, God. So in verses 15 to 18, you know, Paul, Apostle Paul is highlighting several unique uh, characteristics that basically uh, qualify Jesus Christ to be uh, the preeminent one uh, who has super supreme authority over uh, all things. So he is uh, the preeminent one. Uh, that means he is foremost, he is the greatest, uh, he is the finest, he is eminent, uh, uh, one who has, uh, you know, supremacy, which means he has authority, uh, all authority over all things, okay? So that is what he is stating. And this is uh, something that he has received uh, through the inspiration of the Holy S uh, Spirit. And uh, it's also something that, uh, you know, Paul is deeply grounded in because we know that, you know, uh, being a Jew, he was a very zealous Jew, zealous for his faith. And hence he went around persecuting the Christians because, uh, you know, they were uh, saying that uh, they were teaching or preaching that Jesus is uh, God. And, and being a zealous Jew, defending his faith, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, he was persecuting the Christians because for him, Jesus was not uh, God. He was just a, a, a man. But, you know, receiving this whole uh, enlightenment or this, uh, when he was uh, transformed on the way to Damascus, this whole thing of seeing Jesus, the person of Jesus, and having this whole, uh, uh, receiving this whole inspiration of who uh, the, uh, the person of Jesus is, that he is God, you know, uh, he very beautifully uh, writes this. So it is something very, very uh, precious for him, for his understanding of who uh, this Jesus Christ is, who he persecuted, but who, who he un encountered, and now who he is uh, you know, uh, preaching uh, the, the gospel uh, to the point of being persecuted, being beaten, being, uh, being left for dead, uh, you know, struggling through and everything. But it, he's going through all of these struggles and challenges because of this great revelation that he has received of who uh, Jesus Christ is. And that is what is making him so zealous or, uh, you know, so, uh, 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 you know, uh, passionate about what he's preaching, who he's preaching and uh, teaching about. So in verses uh, 15 to 18, he's actually, you know, uh, uh, highlighting several unique characteristics uh, that qualify who Jesus Christ is. 
uh, and that is why uh, you know uh, theologians commentary writers call this as the great christology because it's talking about uh, you know how humanity and deity coexisted in the person of jesus christ uh, it's 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 talking about the person of jesus christ and who he really is so in verses 15 to 18 paul uh, mentions that you know he is the image uh, of the invisible God. The second thing he mentions is he is the firstborn uh, over all creation and that is uh, uh, this is mentioned in verses 15. The first half of uh, verse 15 he says he is the image of the invisible God uh, the, and the second half of verse 15 says he's uh, the firstborn over all creation uh, and then he goes on to talk about in verse um, uh, 16 and verse 17 he talks about uh, him jesus as the creator uh, of the universe why he says for him all things were created in heaven and earth visible and invisible uh, you know all thrones authorities dominion principalities powers everything was created through him and for him and he is before all things uh, and in him all things uh, consist. So in verse 17, he's basically talking that Jesus is the sustainer of uh, creation. He's not just the one who has created everything, but verse 17, he goes on to prove that Jesus Christ is the one who's sustaining all of uh, creation. And then, you know, uh, he goes on to talk about uh, in verses 18, he talks about how he's the, the sovereign head um, of the new creation that is the church uh, the the body of Christ which is a new creation uh, uh, and he is the sovereign that means he, he is uh, he is um, you know he's God he is the head he's the supreme authority over the new creation uh, which is the church and also in verse uh, 18 he's talking about the firstborn from the dead okay and uh, he goes on to talk about uh, in verse uh, uh, 18 also how he is the pre he is a preeminent one of all uh, things okay so how he is preeminent uh, which means that uh, you know he's the greatest he's the foremost uh, he's distinguished the finest one of all things so that is why you know uh, uh, all this just so beautifully uh, inspired by the holy spirit uh, uh, for Apostle Paul and he writes this and uh, because he highlights the unique characteristics that uh, qualify Jesus Christ as supreme over all creation, you know, uh, it's referred to as uh, the great Christology, okay? Uh, so we look at each of these, uh, uh, you know, um, phrases in, uh, in verses 15 to 18, we study that in detail. Uh, and uh, Dina John is asking, first born over all creation, what does it mean? So I'll just explain it while I'm explaining each uh, phrase. So we'll just go uh, one at a time. I hope that's okay. Uh, if you still did not understand, after I explain the first born over all creation, then uh, if you have any more questions on that, you can ask. Is that okay, Nina John? I can, can I just go in order? So you can understand, we will come to firstborn over all creation. Is that fine? Okay, thank you. So the first thing, uh, you know, uh, he mentions uh, here and also after verse 18, uh, you know, also mentions that, uh, you know, salvation uh, is dependent both on the person and the work of Christ. Uh, so Paul in verses 19 to 20, uh, uh, of the same chapter of Colossians chapter 1. Uh, he's highlighting the work of Christ as the reconciler of all things, the one who makes uh, uh, peace. Now, if you look at this passage, you know, there is no one passage in the New Testament uh, that lists so many characteristics that uh, point out uh, to Christ's deity that he is God. Uh, and it's all just found very briefly and shortly and very powerfully in this uh, passage. So along with John chapter 1 verses 1 to uh, 5 or 1 to 7, Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7, you can even remember Colossians uh, chapter 1 uh, verses um, 15 to um, 18 because this is in one passage in the New Testament that lists so many characteristics that point to Christ's deity. Uh, and it's not found anywhere else in such a short, brief, uh, powerful 
a way. Uh, and also we see that in these passages, it uh, presents the supremacy of the person of Christ in relationship to God, uh, verse 15, and his re relationship uh, to creation, uh, verses 16 to 17, and his relationship uh, to the church in verse 80, just like I mentioned out uh, uh, just earlier in the point. So verse 15 is talking about Christ's relationship to God. Then in verses 16 and 17, it's talking about his relationship uh, to creation. And in verse 18, he's talking about his relationship to the church. So let's just look at, uh, you know, do a phrase study of each of these so that we can understand, uh, you know, uh, the deity of Christ um, uh, in detail. And then we'll come back to uh, focusing just, uh, you know, on verses 16 and 17, which is talking about his uh, role in uh, creation. So in verse 15, it says that he's the image of the invisible God. So Paul saying that, you know, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible uh, uh, God. So basically what Paul is asserting is that Christ is nothing less uh, than the exact and the unique image of the invisible uh, God. Now, the Greek word for this word image is ikon. Um, and, you know, this, this uh, term icon uh, in the Greek, it uh, basically uh, expresses two concepts. One is a representation and manifestation. So this word image, uh, basically, if you look at it in Greek, you know, Greek is a very richer language than, um, uh, than English. You know, uh, everywhere we see uh, the word, uh, uh, for example, uh, we can uh, look at uh, uh, you know, this word image, it can refer to different things at different places in the in scripture. But based on the Greek word, like if it's icon, it's basically talking about the image uh, of God. Uh, it's talking about the unique uh, image that God has. It expresses the concepts of uh, representation and uh, manifestation. So, you know, basically an image uh, can be a, a representation uh, and if it is, you know, representation of the real image, the, the correct image. So when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, what you're seeing is a representation of who uh, you are, the exact uh, image of who you are uh, on the uh, in the mirror uh, or on the screen. If you're looking at somebody acting, you're looking at the exact representation of that person on a screen, though the person is not there uh, physically. Um, uh, present, but you're just looking at the represent the exact representation of that uh, person. So it's uh, if it is perfect enough, if this representation is perfect enough, you know it becomes a manifestation. That means uh, it becomes a, a reality of who that person is when that person is there in a person, even though that person is not there. So that's why we said the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit means uh, the visible, tangible um, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit who is there. Even though we can't see him, we can experience uh, his work, his power, uh, and what he's doing in our midst. That's what we mean when we say uh, manifestation. So by using uh, this word image in the Greek, which means icon, uh, Paul is stressing or making a point that, uh, you know, Jesus is the perfect manifestation of God. That means who you're seeing in the real person of Jesus Christ is, uh, you know, you're seeing the invisible God. You're seeing who uh, uh, God is. So to see what God is, you know, we must look at um, uh, Jesus. And, uh, you know, when Paul uses his words, he is the image of God, uh, you know, uh, he's using the present uh, tense. That means he's stressing on that, uh, uh, that word is. He is the image of of God, which is talking about, he's using the present tense. You know, when you are actually studying Greek and you're trying to uh, exegete passages of scripture and you're uh, looking at it in a Greek translation, you know, the tense is very important, past tense, present tense, present future tense. Um, so this word, he is the image. Uh, you know, every word is so important in scripture to for us to understand. So what Paul is basically using is he's using the present tense, which you know, he's so, and he's using the present tense, he's basically stressing that this is how Jesus always was, 
is and will be uh, it also is mentioning that this is how jesus is always and everywhere you know wherever the manifestation of god is this is who god is wherever jesus is you know whether it was in the past uh, whether it was before the foundations of the world, whether he was uh, uh, there creating the world, whether he was in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the future, you know, this is the real, uh, 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 wherever or everywhere, you know, this is the manifestation of who God is. So if you want to understand who God really is, we look at Jesus because he is the perfect representation or the perfect manifestation of who uh, God is. So the very nature and the character of God is, you know, perfectly revealed to us uh, in, in Jesus. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in him, uh, the invisible is made visible. That means uh, because the Old and New Testament uh, makes it very, very uh, clear for us that no one has ever seen God and no one can see God. Okay. But how do we uh, know God? How do we understand? Uh, you know, it is the, the God who is invisible made himself visible in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. So, if you want to understand this invisible God, you know we look at uh, uh, we look at Jesus Christ. We uh, we look at uh, his character, his ways, or how he lived on this um, earth. So, uh, even as we read in John's Gospel, you know uh, the Apostle John makes it very clear uh, in 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 verse eighteen of John chapter one that the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. And I explained to you what it meant, uh, you know, the bosom of the Father, which means who was intimately one with the Father, intimately connected with the Father. You know, this Son has, or uh, this Logos, this Word that became flesh, who is God, who became uh, a man, who is God, who became a human being, you know, who was in the bosom of the Father, who was intimately one with the Father, has made him known. So we can know who God is because the invisible has been, has uh, manifested himself, has made himself visible in the person of Jesus Christ and hence uh, we can know him. So the first thing uh, he's talking about here in um in Colossians chapter 1, you know, is verse 15 is the image of the invisible um, God. Okay, any questions on that? Can we say visible image of the invisible God? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, the, in, the visible person of the invisible God as well, yes. Any question on this first uh, phrase that we studied? Any clarifications anyone needs? Okay. Okay, if uh, there's no questions or clarifications, we'll move on to the second phrase in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse um, 15, where it says, He's a firstborn over all creation. Now, very important to understand this word firstborn uh, because firstborn was a very familiar term in the uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, it held a significant uh, place in the families, in the uh, you know uh, in the inheritance being passed on, uh, in the spiritual uh, uh, inheritance also that was passed on uh, through the generations. So, the firstborn was a very uh, important word. Uh, also, you know, God. Uh, talking about Israel as you are my firstborn. Now, when we look at, again, when we understand scripture, we need to uh, look at it uh, in the entirety of the whole scripture, what this word firstborn means, and also look at what the Greek word means, because it gives us a very uh, richer understanding of, and gives us more clarity on what this word firstborn is. So the Greek word for firstborn here is protokotos. Okay, it is protokotos, I'll explain that, and it's not first created. So some people say that, hey, you know, Jesus is mentioned as the firstborn over all creation, which means he is the first creation, so the first being that was uh, created, which means that he is a created being, and hence he is not God. 
But here, um, you know, Paul is not using the Greek word prototesis. If he's using the word prototesis, it means that he is first created. The Greek word for prototesis means first created, but he's not using the word Greek word pro, uh, pro, uh, prototesis, but he's using the word protocortis, uh, which means firstborn. So this word protocortis has two uh, different uh, connotations, okay, uh, two different um, uh, connotations means two different meanings, uh, implications. There's two different nuances uh, to this uh, this word. Uh, so, uh, protos. You know, if you divided the word protos in Greek means first, first in time, or uh, first in rank. Uh, so basically, it's it's when we look at this Greek word, it's talking about priority and sovereignty. Okay, so it's the word Greek word proto. Uh, kotos, which is uh, here referring to firstborn. It is not prototesis, which means first created. Uh, so we can tell people that this is not that Jesus was the first created being because there was no, the Greek word prototesis is not used, but firstborn. And this word firstborn has um, two meanings or, uh, you know, uh, uh, implications or nuances to this word proto which means first in time or first in rank. So basically it's talking about priority and uh, sovereignty. So, you know, the firstborn, uh, uh, he's the firstborn over all creation. It basically denotes two things uh, of Christ, which Paul is trying to bring about here, that he precedes the whole of creation. Okay, he precedes the whole of creation in time, in rank. He precedes the whole of creation, and uh, 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 and he is sovereign over all creation. So in rank, okay. So he's uh, he is uh, so he precedes the whole of creation, and he's sovereign over all creation. Uh, so the word firstborn, protokotos, uh, means that Christ's priority to all creation in time and his sovereignty over all creation in rank. So in time, he is, you know, above uh, everything because he's the one who created everything. He was there even before time existed, time began. Uh, and he is sovereign over all creation means in rank that he is uh, sovereign, okay? So did that uh, uh, help you understand firstborn over all creation, Nina? Nina John? Okay. So we need to understand clearly that this is not the Greek word prototesis, which means first created, um, but protokotos, which is talking about protos, which is first in time and uh, rank, uh, which implies that Jesus is the firstborn uh, in terms of priority and sovereignty, uh, his priority to all creation in time and his sovereignty over all creation in rank that means he's greater he's the highest uh he's supreme over uh everything and you know uh you know he was there even before time began okay now we look at verse 16 if no one has any questions no questions uh, any clarification anyone needs Okay, I hope it's not going over your head. You are able to understand. Uh, it's quite an, uh, interesting uh, to do a deeper study, and that's why I'm just giving you uh, extra uh, information here, uh, apart from what's there in your notes, so that uh, you can, you know, uh, gather more uh, information. Now we will move on to verse 16. Uh, can somebody read verse 16, please? Somebody who's not read can read verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were 
all things were created through him and for him thank you okay so jackin says can you please explain sovereignty and priority once again in relationship uh, uh, to time okay um so actually the word uh, firstborn implies uh, Christ's priority to all creation uh, in time. That means, you know, uh, time began when, you know, God created uh, everything, but he was, you know, he was there even uh, before time. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, firstborn, you know, uh, we're talking about that, you know, he was not just there when time began. He did not begin to exist, but he existed even before uh, time began because he was the one that was there even before time began because he was the one who created all things. And uh, his sovereignty over all creation, which means in rank, uh, he's uh, greater, he's sovereign because it was through him uh, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, Paul goes on uh, to say, for by him, uh, in verse uh, uh, 16, for by him all things were created, um, you know, and uh, uh, the end of uh, verse 16 says, all things were created through him and for him. And verse 17, he's talking about he is before all things and in him all things consist that means uh he's sovereign that means uh he does what he wills he he chooses to do what he's he wills he does not uh, ask anyone he does not consult with anyone he's supreme authority supreme power and he does uh what he wills and so out of his sovereignty he created everything and in his sovereignty he is you know over all creation did that help check in Okay, uh, we'll come back after the break. We'll uh, meet at 10.01. I just took one ex a minute extra and then uh, we'll meet at 10.01. Thank you so much. I'll meet you after the break, everyone.